Hello and welcome to the Engage Brain Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by LED Goggles. Flash, flash, shine, shine. LED Goggles open up your mind to a new world of possibilities and realities. Using scientifically tested and validated flash patterns, LED Goggles both overloads and underloads your visual cortices in a way that causes them to fill in the blanks with visual hallucinations. Better than VR glasses, LED goggles are like controlled psychotic break. Let me say that again, it's like a controlled psychotic break. So go crazy with LED goggles. Mention keyword engage brain and receive 10% off your order. An old adage about perception is that we don't see with our eyes, but with our brain. Perceptual hallucinations support this adage when experiences without external physical causes are perceived. Coined in 1956 from the Greek roots for mind-revealing, the term psychedelic refers to a broad range of drugs that include peyote, LSD, and psilocybin. When ingested, these substances can cause hallucinations. However, understanding the effects of psychedelic drugs on the brain uh, and cognition is limited, as many of these substances have been banned from federal funding. Today I speak with Elena Garcia about hallucinogens in the brain and new emerging areas of research. hallucinogens in the brain. I think it's a good weekend topic. Uh, and uh, I'd like to ask you, start by asking every, I do start by asking everyone uh, what got uh, their interest uh, in their topic. So uh, what got you interested in the effect of hallucinogens on the brain? In a previous class I had taken here, we had talked a lot about the effects of all kinds of drugs mm-hmm. on the brain on a very like neurological level. Yeah. And I thought this was a good opportunity to see how that translates into perception and the actual I guess, experience mm-hmm. of a specific drug, which I chose hallucinogens. Mm-hmm. And can you tell me what the class that was? Um, biopsych. Biopsych, okay. And is that up at Bryn Mawr? No, it was here. Oh, it was here. Mm. Uh, I'm uh, teaching drugs in the brain next next year, next semester, so I'm trying, I've never taught it before, uh, and I'm just trying to find everyone who, who has taught <laughs> about uh, these before. So uh, did you focus on any uh, like particular class within hallucinogens? Well, at first it just started with hallucinogens, and mm-hmm. then as I was looking through articles and research, I found some about like using hallucinogens to induce psychosis. Yeah. And that interested me more than just topic of hallucinogens, mm-hmm. so I decided to mainly focus on that and like work from there. Yeah. So... The main one that they used was mescaline. Okay. So most of my focus for the project and the paper is yep. on mescaline. Yeah, and what have you been finding for what mescaline is doing once it gets in the brain? It's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could have my notes up. Oh, can I pull yeah, them up? Yeah, pull okay. them out. Yeah. Uh, I, so I did go into detail. Yeah, with that's that. good. And it's just it's a lot of neurotransmitters yeah. and things that I can't exactly remember right. off the top of yeah. my head because I haven't been studying this for years. I've been studying it for a couple months. A couple months, yeah. Yeah, so the uh, I think it's a interesting area because there's a lot of confusion uh, in terms of like classifying uh, different uh, yes. drugs. So lots of things fall into hallucinogens, uh, but their particular action is kind of widely different across yeah, all different it's, classes. Yeah, that's also really interesting that there are so many different things that produce hallucinations. Mm-hmm. Even, like, synthetic drugs versus, like, the natural plant-based. They have, yeah. like, the same basis of things, but they work in very different ways. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I guess the majority of all actions in the brain are caused by changes in neurotransmitters yeah. and hormones and changes of blood flow to different areas. Um, mescaline mimics... Um, specifically dopamine and serotonin, mm-hmm. which is also what has been considered to be one of the, like, I guess, possible causes for schizophrenic hallucinations and yeah. other psychotic hallucinations. So that's one thing that's very similar. Yeah. Uh, and so it's it seems odd that you can just take something that 
looks like or at the like neural um, mm-hmm. microscopic level looks like or acts like uh, things that we produce naturally and just kind of um, amplifies our natural experience of responding to uh, dopamine or uh, responding to serotonin in our brain. Uh, from what I remember of my biopsych class, it's been it's been two years now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but that it's pretty much the basis for all drugs, even right. alcohol. It's just these things that are acting like our neurotransmitters and exaggerating the effects, and it's really cool in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and just how you can take someone's perception, like uh, it, not to be like all weird, but like what is reality uh, when you're just kind of altering something very very small at a, mm-hmm. a very microscopic level in someone's brain to like shift how they're experiencing life at that given moment. Uh, and in terms of um, mescaline, what have they, uh, how have they studied um, mescaline in um, kind of an experimental form? Well, in the 90s, I guess the IRB was more lax on these things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they would actually bring in undergraduate students and give them a specific dose of mescaline and okay. then observe them and have them take these tests that they also use to test various types of mm-hmm. psychosis and compare the results of these, like, people on mescaline with people who have certain psychotic disorders. Okay. Wow. Uh, it kind of reminds me of Project Ultra, uh, the uh, 1960s uh, CIA and FBI uh, investigation into LSD, uh, trying to understand how, if they could, like, weaponize LSD uh, <laughs> onto uh, their, uh, I guess it would have been the Russians. Uh, and so uh, did they find that... Um, specific doses of mescaline were able to like mimic yeah. people with psychotic yes. disorders uh, and how kind of narrow was the range of, upon which um, mescaline could go from like a fun trippy experience to uh, losing break with reality um it's pretty easy okay <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't exactly difficult um part of the the issue that they had was the fact that the participants were in a very controlled environment. Okay. So that's not exactly the same mm-hmm. as someone who's having a psychotic episode. Okay. Like, these people knew what they were doing when they went into it. Yeah. And they knew for a fact that this wasn't actually real, where people who have psychotic hallucinations often don't. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of like rule number one for recreational drug use is, like, use it in a safe environment yeah. with people who are sober, who are ready to take care of you. Uh, so I suppose that was uh, following some of the uh, recommended ways to uh, dose on mescaline. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, don't know much about, about mescaline. It's from a cactus or am I a way off base? I don't actually I mean, know that I was, myself. I was, yeah, <laughs> I was trying to think if it's uh, from a cactus or uh, a fu- like a, you know, mushroom fungus. Um, uh, Live Googling is always the best thing to do on radio uh, or podcasts, uh, so uh, we'll see. I know they're in the like phenethylamine branch of mm-hmm. hallucinogens. Yeah, yeah, it is a cactus. Um, the San Pedro cactus. According to Wikipedia, the <laughs> <laughs> number one source for uh, live Googling quickly. Um, so let's see. Uh, and So you've been focusing on mescaline. Have you kind of touched on any other... Uh, hallucinogens, uh, kind of maybe more. Uh, um, I've done like some preliminary research into ayahuasca, which okay. is completely plant based. Right. It's like Amazonian, the um, parts of the Amazon that are still like in control of like their natural residence. They yeah. use this as like ritualistic. Mm-hmm. So I've done some like preliminary research into that. Just it doesn't really fit into my paper or project at all, but I thought it was interesting, so I looked into it. Yeah, yeah, ayahuasca is actually a combination of multiple plants, Mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. It's like a vine and, I want to say a leaf, uh, but I'm I'm confused there as well. I also know that it's uh, part of the trip on ayahuasca is, like, violent throwing up. Uh, (laughs) So, (laughs) uh, I I don't know how that would feel uh, if someone was kind of breaking reality. That would actually that's pretty interesting. Like, how would natural bodily functions work on hallucinogens? Mm-hmm. How would you perceive that? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, going back to the dosage. Uh, so, what is that kind of fine line between like, oh, I recognize that 
I'm I've ingested something and that's affecting my my body. Oh, I'm throwing up now. Like uh, that's okay. Uh, versus <laughs> like I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> now I'm violently throwing up. Would you even recognize it as violently throwing up? Yeah. You could be expelling demons from your body. <laughs> right. Or like shooting rainbows out of <laughs> your mouth. <laughs> Uh, but I th- think uh, hallucinogens are kind of a confusing area for general public, um, mostly because there hasn't been much research uh, in the area. So you said like the 90s was this popular time for mescaline, but now there's not really any research on it? I mean, there's also the question of how do you research it? Mm-hmm. So there's always the chance that someone would react badly to sure. it, in which case you can't really just give people these substances yeah. and study them in a controlled environment. Right. So most of what you get from hallucinogens is hearing from people who have taken them. Right. Just kind of anecdotal things. Going back to Pro- Project Ultra, uh, it was, some of the studies were conducted at Harvard, and one of the participants in the Project Ultra studies was uh, Ted Kaczynski, uh, better known as the Unabomber. And so there's some some thought or suggestion that uh, the LSD that he ingested as part of the Project Ultra, while a student and participant in the research at Harvard, uh, kind of led him down a path towards eventually becoming the Unabomber. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> there's <laughs> so, no way of figuring that out. Right, yeah, and so hopefully none of these uh, participants from the 90s on, on mescaline are... Um, <laughs> going down that route. <laughs> Not to suggest that all uh, hallucinogens lead you towards being a mass murderer. I'm going to go with no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but so it is uh, tricky. Has there been any research with combining kind of brain imaging with uh, drugs or hallucinogens? Yes. Not... It's not really been empirical research, mm-hmm. but there I've been able to find articles of like in like websites not right. really like journal articles just mm-hmm. being like here are some brain imaging of people like taking these hallucinogens mm-hmm. and I, I haven't been able to trace them back to any empirical evidence that that's actually what they are but yeah it's pretty interesting to see like differences in blood flow and mm-hmm. it's obvious it's actually really obvious to see like whether it's a visual versus auditory sure. hallucination, that's the easiest thing. But mm-hmm. outside of that, there's really no way of being like, look at this brain image. This person is obviously like hallucinating rainbows and unicorns. Yeah, it's right. It's just like they're having some visual hallucination. Ex- experiences, yeah. Uh, and uh, so kind of shifting gears for a second, uh, I, I just mentioned the public, but uh, you created a, a really beautiful infographic about uh, hallucinations in the brain. Uh, do you, have you had any response from friends or family or others who have seen it? Um, well, one of my family members saw your post on Facebook and then decided to make a game out of it to guess okay. which one was mine. Oh, sure. <laughs> and she wasn't able to do it. I was a bit disappointed. Oh, no. <laughs> but outside of that, I also posted it to my own Imgur account. Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. I got a neat and someone criticizing my definition of schizophrenia. Oh, which right. was like I'm using the DSM five. Like I understand that's issues, but for things like this, what am I supposed to do? Yeah, that's the ex- accept- accepted definition. Uh, and w- since you have your own imager account, were you able to get kind of view counts or? Yes, um, about two thousand five hundred wow. views. Wow, that's awesome. And about sixty points. Sixty points. Okay, that's much better than the posts that I put up on it. I should uh, ask you to link the, that so that we can put that one on uh, Tumblr instead of uh, the one I posted. Okay. Uh, but that's awesome. Uh, it's uh, more successful than any of the ones that I had on, on um, post on Imager from people's infographics. Uh, I got really into the infographic thing. Yeah. I had a bit of a history with like graphic design in high school, oh, okay. so I was just like, oh my god, I can do this! Yeah. No, like I said, it looked, <laughs> it looked beautiful. It took way more time than I thought it would. I like had all of the research done and like all of the things I wanted to talk about and then I'm like, okay, now I need to make it look good. And yeah. That took a lot more time than I expected it to. Yeah, that's tricky. That, I'm kind of finding the same thing with the podcast. Like, uh, oh, it's a, you know, 10 minute uh, conversation. Oh, now I have to go find the perfect song for this person and that, write a fake ad about something and, uh, you know, splice together an you introduction. You can definitely find something with classic rock and hallucinations. Yeah, I think, yeah, uh, I think there is, uh, on the thing I've been using, trip rock. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we'll find something kind of like Pink Floyd maybe. 
Um, let's see. Uh, how about going forward? Do you think that there is any newer developing areas of research on hallucinogens in the brain? Um, one of the most recent things that I found, it kind of builds off of the like mescaline induced psychosis, mm-hmm. but not nearly as um, possibly harmful, is um, LED goggles. They've been oh, yeah. using like Purkinje patterns to induce. Um, visual hallucinations Mm -hmm. so while that's very different from like drug induced hallucinations and even like psychotic hallucinations it's very similar to Charles Binet syndrome Uh, can you find that (laughs) okay so Charles Binet syndrome I actually learned about this from a philosophy class I took here cool liberal arts (laughs) (laughs) is um, a syndrome that's usually caused by cataracts in the eyes Mm. where the people who have the syndrome have like vivid visual hallucinations mm-hmm. that are all often like taking things that exist in real life and then just like blowing them out of proportion. Oh, okay. It's named um after Charles Bonnet, who wrote in his diaries of all these like weird things he was seeing in mm-hmm. his old age as he was like confined to his room and like, okay. watching his neighbors. Yeah. So something that always stuck in my mind was he would be like watching his neighbors, he would see this like carriage pull up. <laughs> And then it would just start expanding until it was, like, bigger than the house. Yeah. And um, there have been records of people, like, seeing them on their, like, they feel like they're on their deathbed as Mm -hmm. they're in, like, a nursing home. And there are all these cloaked figures around them. Okay. So it's it's correlated with cataracts. Mm -hmm. Um, So what people have been hypothesizing is that since the eyes don't see, like, visually as well as they are, that the brain is creating these situations and these um led goggles with these Purkinje patterns flashing have found that they produce similar um visual hallucinations yeah yeah that that's fascinating I, i've also seen like sometimes you can like look up on the internet like how can i like create a, a hallucination or whatever and there's ones with sound uh too um like sound slash uh flashing patterns similar to the LED goggles to like experience things that aren't aren't there uh, and so I think we'll turn to wrapping up uh, the the podcast here is there any uh, like one one really important thing about uh, hallucinations in the brain that you'd want to talk about or communicate I mean it's really just a matter of interest mm-hmm. there's not like one takeaway thing from this okay. it's very dependent on what you're interested in mm-hmm. if you're interested in like the neurotransmitter side of it then there's that if you're interested in like what I'm interested in how it translates into the actual like changing of perception yeah. then there's you can take that away Perfect. if you're interested in taking drugs then <laughs> you can look up what are the like safe ways of doing it yeah uh arrowhead i think is uh, kind of a go-to resource for that uh so and then i'll, I'll just uh, finish by asking uh you we were talking beforehand about uh something that you think other people should know about oh, With, yes. uh, <laughs> so recently i have found colored bubbles which are blown like normal bubbles, but they're bright, fun colors. And they stain walls, so don't use them indoors. Yeah, so once the weather stops uh, (laughs) being super cold and it gets back to normal warm temperatures, uh, we can look for those colored bubbles outside on on the green. They'll be pink. All right. Well, thank you so much for stopping by, and have a good good weekend. You too. Thank you very much. So thanks so much to Elena for coming in and uh, talking about such an interesting topic. Uh, It's uh, odd to see how uh, little the federal government wants to understand and uh, explore these different substances uh, and uh, kind of bans federal funding to many of them. So um, maybe with uh, less restrictions on funding, we'll be able to understand uh, these drugs and their interactions on the brain and mind a little bit better, uh, hopefully revealing a more fundamental understanding of how the brain and, and mind work. Uh, So looking to wrap up the show, not too much uh, left. Two segments here, uh, turning to Jake's Jams, uh, something that I'm interested in, want to share with everyone. I saw a really interesting article by uh, one of my favorite uh, bloggers and uh, 
someone I follow on Twitter, the neuroskeptic, uh, who wrote an article about why we're living in an era of neuroscience hype. And it's something that I've been attacking, at least satirizing, uh, with all the fake ads uh, that uh, sponsor, quote-unquote, sponsor the show. Uh, and uh, as a neuroscientist, a uh, neuroskeptic has been blogging about the brain for almost close to a decade uh, and has seen an increase in the number of neuroscience-themed commercial products like brain pills to optimize your mental focus, uh, headbands that promise to measure or stimulate your neural activity to make you smarter, things to make you sleep better or meditate better. Uh, and there's no end of brain training apps. Uh, I've talked about many of those uh, same things, uh, kind of neurostimulating drinks and uh, headbands that you wear, glasses, goggles to do different things, uh, all uh, that revolve around the name with neuro or brain uh, to try to sell their product. Uh, so I think it was a great article. Uh, I've found it on the Kernel Mag or Daily Dot, but it might be uh, in other places, but it's uh, neuroskeptic, why we're living in an era of neuroscience hype, uh, something really important to think about and something that has been a kind of key issue in the cognitive neuroscience class that I've been teaching this semester and something that I'll continue to kind of harp on uh, or educate about uh, going forward in the future. So uh, with that, I'll uh, wrap up the show with uh, Twitter tweets or uh, reader mail, nothing so far, uh, but uh, still open. Uh, you can tweet me at EngageBrain on Twitter, or you can email me at engagebrainpodcast at gmail.com. I'll be excited to uh, answer any questions or take any suggestions for future shows. We're almost uh, wrapping up with the uh, end of kind of the steady flow of uh, people to interview, so we'll, uh, we'll kind of switch up the format here in uh, a few weeks and uh, start looking at uh, different issues in neuroscience and education uh, without uh, an inter interview component. Uh, so it will be great to start getting some questions or uh, some suggestions from any listeners uh, so with that thanks so much for listening this has been the engaged brain podcast Thank you.